Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Institute of World Politics. We're very glad you could join us this afternoon. In case this is your first time at IWP and you're not familiar with us, the Institute of World Politics is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We're dedicated to developing leaders with a sound understanding of international realities and the ethical conduct of statecraft. We're very proud this afternoon to host uh, remarks from Kenneth Daigler. He's a regular guest lecturer at, here at IWP. Uh, he's a former CIA operations officer and veteran of the United States Marine Corps. He also holds uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in history from Center College and uh, Syracuse University, respectively. He is the author of Spies, Patriots, and Traitors, American Intelligence in the Revolutionary War, recently out from Georgetown University Press, I believe. Um, we're very glad to have uh, Mr. Zegler with us this afternoon. Please uh, welcome him to IWP. Well, we're in a dangerous ground here a bit because I've got to go over to the computer and ask the young lady to switch each one of the slides. And unfortunately, I put animation in for various points. But she's sitting there because if not, I'm going to trip over the wires, which may be entertaining but dangerous. <laughs> the good news is there's a clock in the back of the room, so I probably won't talk too long. Now, let me start with a disclaimer, particularly at an institution like this. I do not claim to be a historian in any form whatsoever. I have much too respect for the profession. I'm simply an intelligence officer with about 30 years of experience, and luckily my career spanned almost all aspects of the intelligence discipline, although I focused on human and human-enhanced collection capabilities. And what you're going to find in my book is that obviously I deal with that. Luckily, I didn't have to deal with drones. There weren't such things back in those days. Okay, could you go to the first slide, please? You'll notice the book has a cover that really is very strong. It, it really comes out of action. Obviously, it wasn't my idea. It was a marketing thing. My idea would have been much more mundane. But, apparently, the book business and the intelligence business as a business plan is not all that different. If you're an intelligence officer, the first thing you have to do is you have to identify your target before you just identify what collection process or individual or asset you're going to use. It turns out that when you're writing a book, you're also first, first supposed to identify who your target audience is so you can sell the book. I unfortunately didn't realize that when I got into writing the book. I just wrote the book. But the book came out this past summer, and I happened to be down at Rehoboth Beach for about two weeks. And I was really impressed with the fact that the book cover does stand out. So I thought, uh-huh, what I can do is I can kind of walk around the beach and take a look, see who's reading my book, and then get a sense for who my audience might be. I did that. Came away with something very interesting. I can tell you with 99.9 .9 degree of accuracy that teenage girls are not my target audience. <laughs> Instead, I think it's people like you who are my target audience. Two separate ones. First of all, those who are interested in the Revolutionary War era. And secondly, intelligence people. Why uh, history buffs? Well, history buffs because I'm interpreting the events in the Revolution based on the impact as well as the way they played out of intelligence activities for key events starting in 1765, going up to 1763, uh, 1783, the evacuation of New York, effectively. Now, most books you read are going to be political, military, some economic views of a revolution. That's very understandable. This book looks at events and the results strictly from the intelligence perspective, and I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit later. There are also lessons to be learned because obviously history is to study of the way individuals act, both good and bad. And as we go through some of the areas I'm going to discuss, you're going to find that while we remake all the mistakes, you know, there is a hope that someday we're going to learn from them. So from a historical point of view, you're going to see some interesting things which we will talk about. Now from an intelligence point of view, the American Revolution actually encompassed all three of the key intelligence disciplines positive or foreign intelligence, covert action, and counterintelligence. 
there are examples of all of them in the book, or I should say in all of them in the history of, of the Revolutionary War era. And this is an important concept because while tradecraft principles of how operations are conducted or how intelligence is collected remain basically the same and have since biblical times, the implementation of that depends on the technology and the culture of the period. So there are a lot of modern comparisons if you simply change something from, say, instead of Ben Talmadge's cavalry collecting reconnaissance to American drones doing the same thing. It's the same principle of why and what you're doing, it's just different how you do it. I'll give you even a better example. Probably the, the key to human asset operations is you've got your collection agent who is your most sensitive element. And you've got at the end, you've got your intelligence officer. So what is the weakest link? You've got to communicate between the two. Somehow the information that was collected has to go to somebody that needs it and can do something about it. During the revolutionary period, let's use the Culper Ring, probably the most sophisticated human collection ring that Washington established. How did they do it? Well, an individual in New York City, perhaps sitting at a coffee house with British officers, with whom he may or may not have had a social or business relationship, would learn something of interest. He would then go to a safe house, perhaps a boarding house where he, had, he was living when he was in a city, write it all down, sometimes in secret ink called stain, sometimes using a mask, although that was actually very cumbersome. He would then give it to a courier who was also at the boarding house temporarily, who would then disguise it further, go through British lines, take it out to Long Island, and leave it under a rock in the pasture. He would then go to a local tavern and talk with an individual. That individual's wife, the next day, would hang a certain amount of clothes on a clothesline to dry. Someone on the Connecticut shore would observe that it would be a signal to indicate that the dead drop had been loaded. A whale boat would come over, the individual would go to the, to the safe site, pick up the document, row it back across to Connecticut and give it to one of Ben Talmadge's dragoons to take it to Washington. Today, if there's an agent in the United States of some foreign power, more than likely, he is sitting at a computer, perhaps at a public library, possibly in his home, but more likely in a, in a more public space, and he will encrypt an email or a document, which he will then attach to a note or a comment in some esoteric blog out there in the internet. And then an intelligence officer in their own country of origin will simply click onto that, download it, and decrypt it. Same concept exactly, same principle, just a different use of technology. So there are lessons here if you look for the principles that can be used. Now, another thing an intelligence officer is supposed to do if they establish their credibility either in a sense of expertise or in an alias persona, is they're supposed to answer questions before they're asked. What's the first question an author is normally asked during a question and answer session? Why did you write the book? I'm going to tell you briefly why I wrote the book. I wrote the book because about 2011, I retired from a consultant position with DOD, where I was working on counterintelligence. I thought I had enough thought after all these years I was going to come home and I was going to do more reading, I was going to do some, some hobbies, I was going to go out with my friends more often, etc., etc. And, you know, about two weeks into it, I was well along at least filling most of my time. Until one Saturday when my wife, who was a potter, went to her studio to work. And I decided I wanted to fix myself a lunch. And you know, you've got time in your hands now, so it's not just a ham sandwich, you're going to make something. But, you know, I couldn't find the plate I wanted. I couldn't find all the ingredients. The kitchen just was not organized the way it facilitated by doing any kind of cooking. I had some time on my hands. So I reorganized the kitchen. 
That was actually a mistake in terms of marital relationships. <laughs> the next morning I started writing the book. However, I can't honestly say the book started in 2011. It actually started more in the mid-1990s. When, for reasons that I won't go into, I had a management position at the agency that caused me to get involved with constructing a new set of liaison rooms for CIA headquarters. Now, you've got to remember the period. Mid-1990s, we had just won the Cold War. And what do we do historically when we win something? We recognize that suddenly there's no more enemies. There's no more threat. We're going to reduce the military. We're going to reduce intelligence. We've done, how many times have we done this in our history? And we'll do it again. A lesson in history that, again, we don't learn. But the word came down from what the British would call our political masters, stating, okay, your budget's going to be reduced. You've got to do more with less. Now, nothing strikes fear more in a manager's heart than hearing he's going to do more with less. Okay, but I, you can understand their logic. And we actually took an approach that seemed to make a lot of sense. We decided we were going to maximize our collection capability by building stronger bridges with all the liaison services we deal with. That's the security and intelligence services of friendly countries or neutral countries, and in some cases, depending on mutuality of interest, some possible adversarial countries. So luckily, uh, we have architects, we have builders, we have interior designers, and obviously I didn't do the heavy lifting. All I had to do was to conceptualization of it, decide what the functions specifically were, what kind of facilities we needed, et cetera. So I went around and I talked to the various operating divisions that had all these liaison relations. And one theme kept coming up time and time again. It was that while we had good relations in a general sense, and I knew we had money compared to them, and I knew we had really good technical expertise compared to them, they weren't so sure that being a young service that we really had the experience in handling agents that many of them have had. We have been in operation as organizations for five or six hundred years. Well, I'm, I'm a little bit of a historian in the sense of academic background, so I knew that wasn't quite right. So I did a little bit of research, and the end result was I wrote a pamphlet called The Founding Fathers of American Revolution, which is legitimate history, but a little bit of a propaganda attempt here, to basically demonstrate that for over 200 and some years, we have been running operations, and some of them have been pretty effective. We identified George Washington as kind of a founding father of foreign or positive intelligence. We identified Ben Franklin as the individual in charge of covert action, and not just propaganda, because you'll find he was also very much involved in everything from currency manipulation to basically paramilitary action against the British at that time. And then, interestingly enough, John Jay as counterintelligence, because over a very brief period of time, he ran a very disciplined and very legal organization that ran counterintelligence in the upper Hudson River. We put this into a pamphlet, put the pamphlet out there, had pretty good results. Liaison read it, got some interesting comments back from it, kind of became institutionalized. And to this day, it's still on the CIA website, if you, you care to go there, it's in my pseudonym P.K. Rose. But based on that research, when I finally had time, and when my wife told me I better go find something to do, I decided it was time to write the book. I'm going to talk about three specific areas here that I, I think you might find interesting. First, I will mention that the book covers the entire span, as I said, from the political organizing that went into the American Revolution in 1765 through 1775 until 1783. But it, because of the nature of the way we look at the revolution, it also covers the military campaigns, starting with Boston and the way the Boston element grew through the Long Island debacle, Trenton, the Pennsylvania campaign, Philadelphia, captured, taken back, etc., and going again finally through to Yorktown. I also talk at length about the covert action program with Franks, and we'll get into that a little bit more. 
The first thing I want to talk about is the Sons of Liberty. And it's an apropos time. Has anybody watched the History Channel program, The Sons of Liberty? Very interesting. Uh, sort of a Davy Crockett type of approach to, to history. Not, not very factual, but I suspect rather entertaining. They have poor Samuel Adams jumping over rooftops, escaping British and all. And I, I, I tried to watch it, and unfortunately I know a little bit too much about it because I couldn't find it entertaining. Most people look at the Sons of Liberty, and indeed the storytellers in the TV program do, as a group of kind of drunken individuals. Here we've got a very famous woodcut, probably early 1774, right after the Boston Tea Party. And they're pouring tea down a British official who they have coated in tar and feather. feather. So consequently, the Sons of Liberty as a mob, the Sons of Liberty as a drunken group, again in the TV series, as smugglers and downright crooks. Okay, there's a little truth of that, particularly in the first year, 1765, when they started. But the truth of the matter is, from an intelligence point of view, not just a political organization point of view, the Sons of Liberty was and developed as a classical United Front organization. Next slide. Started, thank you. No, you just go to one. You want, you want people to have me here. Okay. Uh, what is the United Front organization? I think most of you know, but I'll give you a very brief definition. It's an organization that takes and appeals to as wide a base as possible with a very general theme that everyone can agree on. But normally its leadership actually has a much more defined objective. And one of the key leaders was the real Sam Adams, who was neither a drunk nor a cowboy, but a very smart guy. And as early as 1765, he believed that political independence was something that was simply eventually going to develop. Sons of Liberty grew out of response to the Stamp Act of 1765, and groups grew up spontaneously in New York, Providence, and Boston, and then subsequently in other major cities by late 1765. The name was based on a term given by a Whig member of Parliament who in a debate over American reaction to any type of taxation called the Americans Sons of Liberty. Everybody liked that and they, all, they, they simply took that as the name. Okay, political action in the street. They did indeed have mobs. And in the early days in New York and Boston in particular, there were political maturations involved, but a lot of it were street thugs who found it very useful to riot and do other things under the guise of political protest. But rather quickly, some control took over that. By the time we get to the mid-1760s, we've got political action that can come out on a specific cause, make it clear that hundreds of people in various cities are organized for a specific cause. Also, perhaps more importantly, the darker side, these individuals can be organized to intimidate British officials. By the time the Stamp Act actually was supposed to be enacted, there was hardly anybody in any of the colonies who was willing to be a stamp agent. Why? Because the Sons of Liberty were out there threatening them, threatening their families. Not nice, but very effective. Same thing with uh, threatening merchants who during a later period of various commercial boycotts might try to sell any type of product that could be threatened very effectively. Same thing true of public officials. In fact, by the time you get to the early 1770s, British administrative control exists as far as there's a British ban, and that's about it. Now, very interesting aspect here. When we think of something like political action, we tend to think maybe it's something like the Boston Massacre, where people react to actually stimulate their response bias of small British crew. But I want to tell you about something that's a little bit less known. About three months, maybe two months before that, a Sons of Liberty mob had chased a Tory supporter back into his home and were pelting his house with rocks. Happened a great deal. 
His wife was hit by a rock, and in a fit of anger, he actually took a musket and fired it through the window at the mob. Unfortunately, he hit a very young child named Cider. I tell you this because Cider's funeral was orchestrated by Sam Adams to a degree that would make any movie theater happy in terms of the way it was done, with banners and white cloth children, the carrying of the, of the burial casket going around the Liberty Pole, going by the Liberty Tree, with hundreds of people involved. Sons of Liberty was a disciplined organization that could carry a political message very, very clearly. And by the time we get to 19, or excuse me, 1773, we're talking about something where the control of the individuals communicating along the coast is as good as anything you'll see among the Democratic National Committee. Go to the next slide. Second aspect. I think you all know that in the 1760s, early 1760s, Ben Franklin, his first postmaster, actually set up a rather effective, by, by its times, period of communication, postal series. Okay, Sons of Liberty using this as a backbone and establishing their own communications. By the time of the Boston Tea Party and the Boston Massacre, they were able to get communication between cities from Boston to New York, from Boston to Philadelphia, from Providence to Charleston, faster than the British were able to do it. It's interesting to note that the first news of the Boston Massacre, two weeks earlier than the official British report, and therefore you can imagine that it was slanted a little bit in terms of the the Patriot point of view, arrived in London. They were very good at this. They understood not just the use of mob action, but the need to coordinate and communicate effectively. Third aspect, propaganda. Very early on, they were smart enough to enlist most of the printers, i.e. newspaper publishers, in the country. And thanks to the communication they had, and the coordination that Sam Adams and others set up, they were able to have a common theme going, so that the British were being hit by common themes of disagreement, common themes of demand from all along the coast, not just from the troublesome Boston people or the often riotous New York people. At this point, though, we're still talking about a political organization. But we move a little bit further. We start to look at them taking over leadership posts. Okay, you're political as the kind of rump administration of the colonists take over as British legislatures are closed down, officials no longer have control over appointed legislatures or, or voted legislatures. A rump group grows up in almost every colony, whether it be a House of Burgesses sitting as a rump group or whether it be a, a group in, in Boston. The Sons of Liberty were the individuals who took those leadership positions. They moved from that political organization into the quasi-government, shadow government organization. Okay, next slide. Now here's where we really get into where intelligence comes to play in the sense of the way you're moving an organization. They also got involved by the early 1770s in paramilitary activities. They started confiscating powder cannon, armament, taking over various and sundry of the king's arsenals. They moved their people into positions in the militia and also into committees of safety and other organizations that oversaw the local militia. And they established a new element in the history of American militia. They established the Minuteman Company, the quick response company that in theory could within a, a very small given period of time assemble and then march off as required. Security. Very interesting aspect of this with the Committee of Safety. The Committee of Safety was a defensive mechanism that ensured they knew what the British were doing to protect their own meetings, their own printing locations, to kind of protect the armament they had stolen from the British to begin with, and also to protect their leadership. It's interesting to note that it was the Committee of Safety who two months before 
the battle at Concord and Lexington, had monitored the two British officers who had been sent by General Gage from Boston to reconnoiter two routes, one route out to what the British, what the Bostonians call Wooster, and the other from Boston out to Concord. Why is that important? Because the Committee of Safety knew a month and a half beforehand which routes the British were going to take if they were going to raid that particular location and what route they were going to take back. Okay. And most importantly, in early 1774, they created a small group that we now call the Mechanics. Had in a, a leadership sense and a organizational sense by two doctors, Dr. Joseph Warren and Dr. Benjamin Church, but led at the working level by people like Paul Revere and others. The job of the mechanics was more aggressive. The job of the mechanics was not to look defensively, but to look offensively from an intelligence point of view, to find out the British plans and intentions so that you could react to them because you knew what they were going to do. And indeed, Dr. Joseph Warren had a source inside General Gage's headquarters who was able to identify that when those troops were leaving, and there's no secret in terms of troop movement that troops were on the move and where they were going to land, but the question was, where were they going to go? Were they going to go to Wooster or were they going to go to Lexington or Concord? Well, Dr. Joseph Warren's source was able to tell him that. Now, this puts, if you will, a slightly different light in the whole concept of the shocker around the world. Because we all marvel at the fact that these militiamen could somehow just gather and inflict horrendous casualties on the British forces, a, a superior force in terms of discipline. If you look at the fact, first of all, that modern historians will tell you that these Minutemen, by the time they were ambushing the British, were operating at a regimental level of command and control. It's because they already knew what route the British were going to take back. They could leapfrog ahead. They could set themselves up because they knew the lay of the land. They knew exactly what the route was. So it was much less of a surprise that they were able to control the battlefield and do the funneling of the troops the way they did. Now, I want to talk about organization. You know, you need political organization to start a revolution, but it's helpful if you've got some supplies. Unfortunately, being an optimistic nation from the start, we sort of started the revolution without much in the way of an industrial base that would allow us to produce much that would help us actually fight a war. So what do we need? Uh, we need what you always need when you're a developing state or an insurgency. We needed an established political entity normally a state entity that already had an industrial base, already had a military capability, already had the technical expertise. And we found that in a covert action program because at that time, unlike today, nations preferred to have the ability for at least a plausible denial of supporting somebody. So we had a covert action plan with the French an action plan that had it not worked well for two and a half years, it was really doubtful that Washington could have kept his forces in, in the field. Like all good conspiracies, this really did start on a dark and stormy night in Philadelphia in December of 1775. The local papers even described thundersnow in Philadelphia. It was in Carpenter's Hall. And Benjamin Franklin and a couple other members of the newly formed Committee of Secret Correspondence met with an individual identifying himself as a Flemish merchant. In reality, of course, he wasn't. He was a secret representative of the King of France. Now, remember I said December of 1775. They spent three meetings, and they talked over what Americans were going to do, what the French might do, negotiations, if you will. The end result was that Ben Franklin and the Americans representing the, Congre the Continental Congress promised two things. Promise number one, we will seek political independence from Great Britain. Number two, 
we will defeat the British Army. A little optimistic in the second, pretty sure of the first. The British in turn said, well, in return for this, as long as we have the ability to deny it to Britain, which sits on our coast, much closer than it does to you, we will help you militarily and we'll help you with money. Now, two of the key fat figures here are Ben Franklin, who subsequently moved to Paris to head the Paris Commission, which was the U.S.'s first diplomatic mission abroad, located just outside of Paris. But on the left, we have an individual named Pierre-Auguste Beaumarchais. For any of you who are literary oriented, you probably know his name. He is the author of The Barber of Seville and The Marriage of Figaro, which has operas gained quite a bit of fame. Also, though, he is a very, was a very effective secret agent in the covert action program for the King of France. Next slide, please. What resulted from those meetings was the creation of a commercial cover company headed by Beaumarchais in alias in Paris called Portelais and Company. This was a company which was the flow-through mechanism for purchasing military supplies, military expertise, uniforms, or anything else needed in the way of military supplies, and having it sent under the guise of commercial action to the colonies, often through the Caribbean, but sometimes directly into the colonies, depending on what the circumstances were. This was no small company. By the time it was fully in action, it was involved in millions of what for the French would be dollars. It had over 100 ships operating. This was no small action. This was really quite a big deal. In effect, it was transferring the old armament of the French army to the Americans. It's always good to have gunpowder if you're going to start a war. Uh, you may recall that at Bunker Hill, one of the reasons the Americans were thrown back was that they only had three shots per person. By the time Washington is at the key point attacking Trenton, admittedly he's only got about 3,000 effective, but he's also only got about four shots apiece for them because nobody in the, in the colonies could produce gunpowder. Hard to run a revolution when you can't produce gunpowder. One of the first things Fortales did was ship hundreds of tons of gunpowder to keep the army going. It was estimated by historians that at the Battle of Saratoga, one of the key battles in terms of bringing the French into a formal relationship with us, 80% of the gunpowder came directly from the shipments from this, this company. I cannot emphasize enough that the revolution would have faltered militarily without this Fortaleza and Company as a quarter action. Ah, once again, please. Cannons and muskets. There was a small capability to create hunting rifles, but there were no real arsenals. There was a capability to create some old cannon, but most of the cannons the, the, the Americans had were reused from the French and Indian War, or they had been able to capture from the British, and also, frankly, during the war, particularly during the Long Island uh, New York and New Jersey period, they were losing cannon as well. Cannon was a vitally important thing. All the weapons, again, we just didn't have it here. We had to get it from abroad, from a country that was already producing it as an industrial base. But the other aspect is to... Uh, oh, okay, all types of other military supplies, quite, quite obviously, because we also didn't have the capability to produce even something as mundane as uniforms in massive numbers, let alone tents or cooking pots or type you need simply as a logistic element for the military. Technical expertise, something we don't often think about. When you're going to run a war, you've got to have a little bit of technical expertise. And what the Americans perhaps made up for and courage was that they didn't have a lot of that. But they needed officers particularly with two kinds of expertise. One was artillery. And the second was engineering. And so, creating a tradition that exists to this day, the, the Continental Army, or the U.S. Army, decided to hire as contractors military officers from Europe, not just from France, but from other countries in those two specific fields. And again, without them, the fortifications 
both defensive and offensive. And much of the artillery that Henry Knox was working on really would never have been effective in the later years. They were able to teach a whole generation of American officers exactly how to handle this, this type of a situation. I actually go back for a second. And I'll tell you why. Because we talked about the need for understanding lessons from them then and now. Let me tell you a story. It goes to World War I. You may remember in World War I, Blackjack Pershing had a very famous quote, Lafayette, we are here. In other words, we're going to return the favor. We're sending people over to fight for your country as you fought for us. Okay, there's a very famous cartoon. And I continue to believe it was in the Chicago Tribune, but I've had people tell me it was from the New York paper. It shows a beach in France. And you've got the Americans coming off of the landing craft. Not the landing craft, we think of World War II, but almost, almost folks. And they've got the tin hacks, and they've got the M1 rifle with the huge bayonet. And they're coming off, and there's the cliffs of France, and there's a ghostly figure up there of Lafayette. And there's a little blurb of what Lafayette is supposed to say. Okay. The American blurb says, Lafayette, we are here. The French historian tells me that what the Lafayette blurb says is, but did you bring your checkbooks? Because you forgot to repay us for all the money we gave you for the Revolutionary War. Kind of an important point to keep in mind if you're going to assist insurgencies with or without plausible denial, or if you're going to help a new country. A couple of lessons here that we learned the hard way that maybe policymakers ought to keep in mind. Number one, eventually you're going to need to provide a lot of money to make it work. Secondly, you're going to have to provide expertise because indigenously, indigenously people normally don't have. Thirdly, eventually you're going to have to put disciplined troops on the ground, just as we needed the actual French forces, both Navy and Army. And fourth, don't expect to be paid back. Okay? All right, now we can go to my friends here. I want to talk a little bit about counterintelligence because, to my way of thinking, it is the least understood of the three intelligence disciplines, and among the American population, the one most suspect of all, because we really, obviously, <coughs> honor our rights a little bit more than our responsibilities. And counterintelligence always looks like something that's very interesting, very nosy, and very un-American. Well, during the war, we had at least two good traders. We had actually several more, but I've got two up here. I think you might recognize on the left Benedict Arnold. Interestingly, most books about the Revolution will have something about Benedict Arnold. The guy on the right is Dr. Benjamin Church, who, in addition to being involved with the Sons of Liberty at a very high level, and also being one of the leaders of the mechanics, also was at one point the head of the hospital service for the Continental Army. Not a commissioned officer, but the, the civilian head of the entire medical corps. And as but many of you may know, he was also a paid agent of General Gage. He was a British spy. A British spy who was an incredibly deceitful individual. And in my way of thinking, as I explain in the book, you know, when you start the revolution, We've got to understand that everybody's British. It's very hard to be a spy or a traitor if you're British to start with. So you've got to be very careful when you talk about loyalties. It's not fair to say that just because somebody has a different political loyalty at the start of a revolution that they're a traitor or a spy. I know his, history is always written by the winners, but we've got to look at this objectively. But this is a guy who qualifies, because there's no ideological base here for him. He was strictly in it for the money. And Go over to the next slide. We're going to see that there are really some very common CI indicators, frankly, the ones that are still used today in initial CI investigations and looks of these two individuals. Lifestyle living beyond his favorable means. For Dr. Church, he came back from England as a physician with his wife, settled in Boston, and within a year and a half, 
met a half price British officer named Captain Price, who introduced him to a local official, Commissioner Robinson. At the same time, his lifestyle and his expenses tended to exceed what he was making as a doctor, and he found enough money to establish a mistress quite nicely in Boston. There was obviously no CIA organization among the Sons of Liberty. There, everything was taken as it was in Britain on who you were, what your status was, and indeed, if you were a man of your word. As a matter of fact, the security test for individuals in the mechanics to prove that they were loyal and to ensure there was what we would call operational security was that at the start of each meeting, you would put your hand in the Bible and swear that you would never say anything about what was said in the room. Some took that more seriously than others. Dr. Church didn't take that at all. Benedict Arnold. When Benedict Arnold takes over in 1778 as military governor of Philadelphia, immediately he starts using military equipment and means to create deals with Tory merchants that allows him to prosper a great deal by controlling commerce. He also finds that socially he prefers interaction with most of the merchants who are, are wealthier, who also happen to be of a Tory nature. And, of course, he starts to take up with a woman, Peggy Shipton, from a Tory family, who he subsequently marries. She's a much younger woman, plays a little bit to his ego. He's, at this point, he is a rather dashing guy, but a little bit banged up after, uh, after the battle of Saratoga. Anyway, had there been anyone who was really looking at these people from an objective point of view, which is what CIA is supposed to be all about, they would have known that well before these individuals were exposed, and in both cases, well before they did their worst, most dangerous work from the patriotic or, look, or uh, American point of view, there was something going on here that didn't look right. Yes. The questionable associations I already mentioned, but they could be explained away. Benedict Arnold explained it away in a very interesting manner to his officers, and that was that he still had debts owed him by the Continental Congress, which was true. He had spent a lot of his own money earlier in his campaigns up in the lakes and in West Virginia and northern New York. So he said that what I'm doing now, my control of this, my manipulation of commerce, is a way of paying myself back until I can get reimbursed by the Continental Congress, which was notoriously slow reimbursing anybody. Benjamin Church was able to explain away his working with the British officials and all, and interestingly enough, his conversations with senior British military people, including General Gage, by saying, well, I'm a doctor and sometimes I have medical responsibilities, and also I'm just kind of finding out what they're doing. I'm doing this, which is actually very good cover, I'm doing this because I'm learning more from them that will help our cause. So again, on the face of it, unless you look a little bit deeper, sounds like a pretty good reason to rationalize and explain what you're doing. However, we get to the point of suspicious behavior. Let's talk about Dr. Benjamin Church first. Benjamin Church meets Paul Revere after the Battle of Concord. He's all polite. Paul Revere has lost his horse at this point. I won't go into the whole deal behind that, but he's on foot because the British have taken his horse. He was caught by a British patrol. And he sees Dr. Church, and he later tells in a, in a letter he wrote that he met Dr. Church, and Dr. Church was all bloody. And he asked Dr. Church, what are you done? And Dr. Church said, I have just been in a terrible battle. And Revere says, well, you know, I had never really been all that fond of Dr. Church because of his attitude towards most people. He was a little bit of arrogant. But I figured that any man that would shed blood for this cause must be a good man. Dr. Church then subsequently took the message back to Mrs. Revere in Boston that Paul was without his horse and therefore couldn't get back and needed some money. So she gave Dr. Church the sum of either 40 or 50 pounds, I forget what. It was a, not a bad amount of money in those days to take back to Paul so he could buy a horse. Interesting to note that Paul never saw that money again. 
little little small things like this that would tend to indicate this is probably not the most nice guy I want to deal with. Uh, also, the suspect behavior had to do with one of the one of the bad aspects. If you shut down some place from a security point of view, is it works both ways. Gage shut down Boston as a defensive mechanism, and it meant that it was harder for the, the colonialists, the patriots, if you will, to get intelligence sources of what is going on in Boston. But it also makes it very difficult for British spies outside of Boston to get information back inside. Church was in that kind of a situation. So he decided to use his mistress, who he had been supporting, as a courier. Now it's fairly obvious from reading how the story works out that she probably was his mistress for non-intellectual reasons because the way she handled this wasn't terribly great. She took the letter to Newport to another former lover of hers and asked him, because he was a baker, to give it to a British captain on a ship who was sitting in, in Newport Bay. And there was a lot of that trading going back on and forth, not unusual, but the letter was in code. Now, this guy was about to marry another woman, so was not all that enamored to have a former mistress come and meet him. But he was a very thoughtful guy, and it took him about two weeks. But he finally opened the letter, and he looked at it, and it was in code. <coughs> not being stupid, he thought, something's going on here. So he took it to another friend, who agreed that, gee, it's in code. He seemed to be very cerebral types, because it took him another two weeks until they finally took, took it to the authorities in the form of General Green, commander of the Rhode Island forces around Boston. Eventually, it was decoded, because it was a rather simple code. The woman was called in. George Washington personally interrogated her in a rather strong manner for George, and found out that the uh, message had come from church. And of course, it was a detailed description of troop capabilities of the Americans. Fairly accurate, but a little bit overblown. Now, Benedict Arnold, what, what do we have there in a way of suspicious behavior? Well, not only does he marry Peggy Shipton, who had a social relationship, not a sexual relationship, but a social relationship with John Andre when the British had controlled Philadelphia for those few months. He also was involved with other loyalists, some of whom were actually stay-behind agents for the British in Philadelphia. So, by the time Arnold is married to Peggy Shipton, within less than a month, he is sending correspondence to General Clinton, suggesting that for a certain sum of money, he can give up this or give up that or what you want. The real suspicious behavior, though, that anyone should have seen came when he was given command of West Point. I mean, Washington, I think, should have been a little suspicious because Arnold had always been a fiery, aggressive leader, much more of a leader than, than a good military theorist. Yet he was offered command of the left wing of the Continental Army, which was a post of honor, to say the least, and he turned it down because he said, my leg has been bothering me and I prefer to have West Point. As soon as he got to West Point, the first thing he did was start to move troops around. He basically broke the garrison down, moving it to other positions outside of the main fortifications, protecting the Hudson. He also dissipated his supplies. And he called in all of the local tactical intelligence officers and immediately demanded that he be advised of any operations by name and full identities anything going on in the New York region from West Point all the way down into New York and Long Island. The kind of behavior that someone of the CIA mentality would have picked up on. Finally, ego issues. Anybody who knows anything about Benedict Arnold knows that he did have an ego. He did not get along well with his peers. He was constantly fighting. He never felt he got the recognition he deserved. And a lot of his apologists will say that's very true. He didn't. And indeed, he might have been shafted by Congress here and there. And there were a lot of political maturations involved in colonial, 
colony politics between the various colonies that did affect him. But other officers somehow managed to make it through without deciding that they were volunteer to the British. Church was exactly the same way. By the time we get to 1773 and 1774, Dr. Church is a very arrogant individual. He's respected within the Sons of Liberty because he's been with them for a long period of time. He does a lot of writing for them. He is running important operations like the mechanics. But interestingly enough, the one individual who has a sense of counterintelligence is Dr. Joseph Warren, the other head of the Sons of Liberty. Dr. Warren does not trust Dr. Church for reasons that he indicates just feels the man does not have a strong moral base. I simply do not trust him, which is kind of important because if he had trusted Dr. Church, he would have advised who the source was in Gage's organization that gave him the information about Lexington and Concord. Now, the advantage there is that we wouldn't know who that source was today. I mean, we, we don't know who it is. There is some speculation it was the American-born wife of General Gage. However, that's very questionable, and my suspicion is that if you really want to find out who the spy was, or you look at the social group around either Mrs. Gage or around her two brothers, who happened to be the private and intelligence secretary to General Gage. But So all of these indicators hold true for the day. These are what you look for initially when you're looking at a scrub of someone from a counterintelligence point of view. The point is today we do have organizations that do that. So it may seem somewhat intrusive. I, I suspect it is when you get to the later aspects of it, but you've got to understand that throughout history these characteristics, once identified and once tracked, you know, they can be anybody from a Hanson to a Ames. It's just, it is the nature of humanity that they're correct. That pretty much are the three issues I'd like to kind of bring up with you. The book goes into a lot more, but I think these three have a legitimate bearing in what we're looking at today. In terms of principle, and what has happened in the past, and what you might learn from the behavior of people in the past. Are you ready for question and answer? Um, if you could please um, state your name and affiliation when you ask your question. Um, if anyone has any questions, please. Uh, Dennis Kelly, U.S. Army. Was there a congressional role at all during that period? The Congress at that time did not have, well, well, I mean, what do you mean? You mean as an intelligence? Oversight, any? Yeah, no, there really, there really wasn't. One of the, I happen to really have a very strong appreciation for George Washington. He was a good intelligence manager, but more importantly, he was a really good politician. He was a good leader. Wasn't all that great a general, but he was a good leader. Okay, now Congress at that point was very much involved in just surviving. They did a lousy job of supporting the Army. It's much to Washington's credit that there were only two real elements of government in the United States after the Revolution started. One was the Continental Congress, and the other was the Continental Army. Those were the only two elements that really were on a national basis that combined all 13 of the colonies. You may recall that we lost Philadelphia, our capital, because Congress just moved out. That confused the British tremendously, because up to that time, if you were fighting a war and you captured the other purpose capital, that kind of meant something. It showed once again, not unlike the War of 1812, that we're a little bit more flexible in this, this country as it goes. But it's the of Congress, they were able to move very quickly, and it didn't disrupt them. Washington was very good in that he established a principle of civilian control over Congress, but it was a very passive, non- intensive type of control. He would write letter after letter to them asking for supplies. He would tell them what he was going to do. They would come back with recommendations of a military nature, which he would sometimes follow, would not follow because they were always done as the correspondence of the time dictated, more as general suggestions. 
Congress played no role in intelligence. Uh, the one counterintelligence point of view that's interesting is that one member of the Continental Congress early on from Pennsylvania actually was reporting on a daily basis what the Continental Congress did back to the British. However, he was very honest about his Tory tendencies, so I'm not sure you could call him a traitor. He was just someone who, who was doing what he thought was right. Bob. Uh, can, um, I have a question here on the say legal proceedings warrants probably don't exist on um, civilians that um, were spying for the British. So how did they handle that? I mean, and, they just hung up? Well, no, not, not often. But it was all handled locally. Mm -hmm. John Jay, as you know, for a brief period of time had an organization that was based on law where individuals were identified by agents who were sent out to penetrate local groups and consequently allowed their capture. They were then sent before a tribunal. Evidence was provided. Your accuser was there. Punishment was given out on a realistic basis, often just by taking an oath of loyalty the people were, were forgiven. Once that ended, it became like any other civil war where disputes of a personal nature, of business nature, and neighborhood nature was handled under the guise of counterintelligence. Not as much violence as you would think, but a lot of people lost property and all because their neighbor condemned them. There wasn't a lot of due process because we did not really have much of a centralized government. Again, the two functions nationally was an army and a congress. A congress was busy debating all sorts of things, not the least of which were mundane things like who are we going to appoint as generals and why can't we get Pennsylvania to provide more logistics and, and what have you. So the, um, most of the trials, to the extent they had any, were largely military? If you were in the military, you could be tried by court-martial. Okay, but if you were civilian? Civilians were handled by local groups, sometimes appointed, sometimes simply ad hoc. It depended on local government. Okay. It was only under John Jay that there was any control, and that was only in the Hudson River Valley for a brief period of time. It was a very ad hoc thing. You know, I mean, we, we're not good at CI. I mean, the same similar thing happened in the early phases of the Civil War with us. And it's a sad thing because CI then becomes less than a reputable, legitimate, lawful entity. I honestly believe that if we had used John Jay's system and established that throughout, that that history nowadays would put CI in a much more acceptable light to the general public because it would have been lawful from, from day one. And those of us who were in CI regret very much. <laughs> yes, sir. Tom Parker, Washington University. I assume the, the primary intelligence collection targets for both sides was what the other side was going to do militarily. In terms of intelligence analysis, though, which is a bit broader, did both sides look at uh, morale among the colonists? Discussions about the war back in London, um, and if so, which were both sides fairly accurate or inaccurate, and if one side were better than that, or, or not? One British general, and I, I, I can't give you the, the quote and name and date, said that Washington didn't beat us militarily, he beat us because they, they spied better. I'm not sure that's completely true. Uh, tactical military intelligence and strategic deception were the real strengths that the American forces had under Washington. I think very few people realize that after Trenton and Princeton, it was an excellent deception plan that allowed Washington to keep the British from having a winter campaign against troops that were, were simply isolated, poorly supplied, and enlistments were causing a complete turmoil. By the time we get to Saratoga, uh, excuse me, to Yorktown, we've got a nine-month deception plan that is as good as anything you could come up with in World War II to convince Clinton that it's New York that's going to be the target as opposed to Yorktown. And I outline that in the book step by step by step. So Washington did very well. British had a problem. I think we're going to go back to a, a real basic element of the American Revolution. 
And that's the Americans didn't have to win the American Revolution. They didn't have to win the war. The British simply had to lose it. When you look at the British perspective of the Americans, what you find, and here is a lesson for us as, as a country, they did not understand they were dealing with a different culture. Nick Bunker, in his book, Empire on the Edge, makes the point that they almost looked at the American colonies as if it was the same as Ireland. It wasn't. The yeoman American was a much different breed. The merchants had a much different mentality than you had back in Great Britain. The British never understood that. The arrogance factor, you mentioned morale. The British weren't concerned with morale because as far as they were concerned, the Americans were just farmers who couldn't fight. The British officer, Navy and Army, held American troops in very poor regard, even after they got their butt kicked at several locations. And again, Nick Bunker's book, which is incredibly comprehensive and well-researched, indicates that from a political and economic point of view, they had many other concerns. They really weren't focused as a government on what was going on. There was no plans and intentions. On the American side, Washington, with his small battle staff, were the analysts of intelligence. It's interesting to note that because of economies of scale, Washington was both the chief intelligence officer from an operational point of view, often micromanaging agents, as he did with the Culper Ring and the group around Philadelphia. But at the same time, he was the key consumer of it. Very interesting, because there's always going to be frictions between those two. The consumer wants the information now. The intelligence officer wants to be sure his, he can protect his sources and collection methods so he can continue to do it. And with Washington, you see this friction as well in some of his correspondence with the Culper Ring, with David Majors, with John Clark, with Alan McLean around Philadelphia, all of these individuals. He did pretty well. On the British side, let's take, let's take Clinton right at the very end. Who was his intelligence officer? John Andre. John Andre was apparently a very nice social guy, well liked by everybody, even, even thought to be a fine fellow by the Americans who subsequently hanged him. However, he was basically a social staff officer who had traveled through the United States before the war, but really got his rank and his grade because he was very good at creating a social environment that the British Army needed. He was not a field commander, yet he became the intelligence chief. The mistakes he made in handling Arnold are primarily the reason that Arnold was caught. And I go into that in detail, analyzing this. What we had was the British allowed Benedict Arnold possibly their one chance at that point to at least affect a stalemate, if not actually win a military victory by separating the colonies of, along the Hudson Valley, they allowed him to basically run the operation. And of course, he, his objectives were not, I want to help the British win the war. His objectives is, I want some money, I want some ego, I want to demonstrate to my peers I'm better than they are, etc. So his trade craft stunk. I eventually got Andre Hunt. And, excuse me. That was a long answer, but I hope I I made the point there. Sir. Uh, Jake Waxman, Truman National Security Project. Uh, I was wondering, it seemed like, especially in the early days of the Revolutionary War, um, there was an emphasis on more political action and economic action um, than just uh, military and paramilitary affairs. Uh, what do you think of the lesson is there for current activities? Think we've kind of forgotten about that part of intelligence? No, I don't think so. And I think you, you blend them together. I think some of what you're talking about is what was going on out of the Paris Commission. You may be aware that there were some sabotage attempts at the uh, dockyards in, in London. Not very effective, but enough to scare the British public. There, were, there was at least one raid by John Paul Jones at Whitehaven, a port in uh, in Britain itself. The only attack on Britain in over like 150 years, which did not do a great deal of damage, but certainly made insurance rates shoot up. 
So I think they're I think they're interlocked. I think when you talk about when you talk about covert action, you know, there are really three phases of covert action, and perhaps we have forgotten this, that they all blend nicely together. The first is political action, the second is propaganda, and the third is paramilitary, and all three affect one another. Uh, but you, you may want to extend a little bit on your question so I can be a little bit more specific. Um, it feels like the U.S. no longer invests as much in non-military or non-violent means of um, covert clandestine action. And it looks like in the Revolutionary War they did much more of that. Well, now, now you're asking me something I will give you my opinion on rather than something we will factually look at. Political action, the development of something like a united front organization, takes time and effort. You have to have a patience for that. We Americans are not patient. Every intelligence service operates within its own national culture. And one of our characteristics that our adversaries and our friends know is we're not a patient people. We want things right away. Tell you who's patient. Another former intelligence officer named Putin. Very patient. Because if you look what he did in Crimea, you tell me that that's not exactly the steps that were taken and identified in the book by the Sons of Liberty. Because it was a classic united front operation that moved to fruition. He had set the seeds there 10 years ago with organizations that started to develop support, started to do basic planning, started to do basic reconnaissance of, of where various centers were. Or we just don't have the patience for it. It's a lot easier to send up a drone, particularly if you need immediate results to satisfy. I mean, we're, we're a different country. Hans Homer, uh, intelligent positions, I guess, for work purposes. Um, so you think by the way the U.S. started that we would be some of the world leaders in insurgency and insurgency theory. We're not. When did that change, in your opinion? We've never learned lessons. We've really never listened. Uh, one of the points in the book, you know, I, I have a little bit of a background in, in Chinese counterintelligence. So I'd like to think it was something in the book about that, but I couldn't find any Chinese agents. But what I could find <laughs> was that General Green's protracted war during the Southern Campaign matches almost to a T what Mao Zedong did during the Long March. And I guarantee you, General Green never read uh, anything about well, never read anything about Sun Tzu. And I guarantee you, Mao Zedong didn't read anything about General Green. We had the common sense, because that's what tradecraft is, as you well know, is common sense and, and discipline. We had the common sense to do a lot of these, these things under threat. Civil War is another example. We relearned a lot of lessons, and by the end of the Civil War, we're doing intelligence quite effectively. But we forget so quickly. I don't know whether it's because we, we have a perhaps a slightly more rotation of political leadership than parliamentary governments or certainly dictatorships have. But there is not, you know, we, we were lousy colonials. Let's be honest. We started with the Philippines and we mucked that up badly. We haven't done well since. We're, we're not, we don't have the mentality of colonists. And I mean, I could tell you stories that you're aware of how real colonialists keep a country under, under a type of control. That's not what we do. It's not our culture. And it's kind of like CI. The point I'm making the book is we are the most poorest CI country in the world because we respect individual rights so strongly. And, you know, we got to live with it because that's the way we are. And rather than adopt some very strict procedure that would basically affect a lot of our, our born and historical values, it's not worth it. We're going to have to overcome this problem a different way. Same thing with college. We should never do that. A nation building? We don't know how to nation build. Look at the problems we had between the Articles of Confederation and the U.S. Constitution. And then the War of 1812, where New England almost, uh, almost separated. I don't, mean, I don't mean to be pessimistic. I mean, far, far from it. But, you know, it's our values that are going to keep us where we are. But our values inhibit our behavior, and we should recognize that and pride in our plate.
That's got nothing to do with the revolution. Yes, ma'am. Uh, along the lines of your describing the American attitudes, uh, there's a persistent school of thought that the British have thereby used us in, in really uh, advancing their own agenda, but with our military strength and might and, and innocence. What is your position on that? Well, that's a very complex subject. I have had my dealings in the intelligence realm with both MI5 and MI6, and they're, they're a very capable service, as, as you might expect. Does Great Britain have its own vested interest in way of doing things that may not necessarily parallel that of American interest? There's no question that they do. On occasion, one has to compromise because of something in a bargaining sense you need from them. So I think it's a give and take. I don't think we've been terribly manipulated by the British. I believe the last time that really has been historically demonstrated was the relationship between Churchill and Roosevelt based on Roosevelt's emotionalism and his response to some things. In fact, that Churchill just was a really good politician who knew how to, how to be a politician, which is something that seems to be a lost art nowadays in terms of compromise, but compromise that maybe gives you 55% as opposed to everything you want. I, I have not seen that, but there's always the need for compromise, whether it's an intelligence liaison or whether it's a national security, because the Things will differ. Our closest allies in the world are, without question, Great Britain and Australia at this point. Now, we've got Canada, but poor Canadians, you know, they don't put a lot of money into national defense, they have other things. And New Zealand is a very quirky little place that kind of goes its own way a bit and it doesn't really have to worry a great deal about international affairs. But each one of those countries also has a very unique national interest that we don't necessarily share, and a political base that needs to have that national interest implemented. Just basic politics. Are there any other questions? Uh, two, Michael, so two separate questions. I guess you mentioned uh, first that it wasn't um, America's to win, it was British to lose, and they, they were the all powers to pull, you know. The sun never sets the British Empire and kind of looked down on American farmers with pitchforks, starting from the Boston mob to the Minutemen militia, um, and even you know 13 different state armies rather than a, before the Continental Army. But what role, I guess my first question is, what role did the militia play in addition to the Continental Army? And my second question, completely different, you talked about our private relations with France and kind of getting them involved, bringing them down everything else. But the British also have the relations with the Haitians we kind of undercut that a little bit and trying to bribe the Haitians and giving them land and everything else to kind of prevent them from helping the British so we didn't have a... Slightly different kind of relationship. First, a militia. Great question because anybody who looks at the Revolutionary War knows there's a constant battle as to the value of and the role of the militia. And it's only, I'd say, in the last 15, 20 years that we've given the militia their due. I mean, in the set piece battles, when Washington attempted to use the militia, he found that they couldn't stand up to a bayonet charge. Consequently, they constantly retreated, maybe after firing one or two shots. Sometimes they just panicked. You got six inches of cold steel coming at you, and you got a musket with no bayonet on it. Let me tell you, there's a reason to retreat. <laughs> yeah. However, if you look at New Jersey, particularly from the period of November, December of 1776 through, this, through 1777, what is often called the uprising of New Jersey, the militia was invaluable in terms of pinning down and collecting tactical intelligence and stopping pouring forage parties and basically keeping the British in a great deal of disarray. When you get down to the south, even at the Battle of Cowpen, Dan Morgan used the militia very effectively by recognizing what they were. The militia were farmers who would come out to fight when called upon, but also had harvests they had to take care of, wives and children, cows they had to milk. When used within their own ramification of what their job was, they actually didn't do badly at all. Now we also had a situation where, particularly in the South, 
he had an awful lot of militia commanders who kind of felt a little bit more independent than they should have. Consequently, they weren't always willing to coordinate as effectively. And so they kind of go do their own thing as opposed to going a few continental line troops that were down there. So it's a mixed bag. But the militia is coming out to be a much more meaningful force, particularly in terms of keeping British troops outside of New York City or outside of Philadelphia very much contained and acting as a screening mechanism and when necessary acting as a reinforcement capability that Washington could put forth and propagandize to the enemy to indicate what he wanted to indicate about a larger set of forces there. So I, I personally think the militia got a raw deal in time until recently. Now what was the other question? Um, just about the Haitians as far as... Right. Well, you know, the relationship between the British government and the Haitians was that the British government had a very small army, had traditionally had a very small army, spent most of their money on the Navy, and the Navy was much more cost effective. Plus it protected their commerce, which was the key behind the British Empire. They needed more troops, so they basically hired mercenaries from the various princes. So it wasn't a geopolitical alliance as much as it was an economic military alliance in the sense that these troops were, were purchased. Now you are aware that uh, Ben Franklin, among others, did some really good propaganda against the Hessians. Washington did some good propaganda in terms of using Hessian prisoners going back to try and encourage more desertions. Of all of the troops, as you might expect, those who were under Hessian command and were Hessians more of them defected, more of them stayed at the end of the revolution than as two of the British forces. Because basically they were offered land. All of Pennsylvania going down to Maryland, you've got German speaking population to start with, they were welcomed into it. One of the most famous propaganda pieces is the one um, Ben Franklin wrote about a supposed letter from the prince of one of the principalities to the British government and to his own commander saying, these cripples that you're talking about in your casualty reports are of no use to me. Leave them be. Let them die because then I can get the money for the dead bodies from the British government. That obviously created quite a bit of okay. Now, the French alliance was different. The French agreed to work with us because they loved liberty. No. They agreed to work with us because we were sticking something in the eye of Great Britain. They weren't all that happy about the end of the French Indian War and the loss of their empire. They also knew that eventually they and Great Britain were going to come to fight again. I mean, their national interest was to break off the colonies. Does that sound familiar? You know, national interest and why we support an insurgency or a civil war of some kind? Yeah, pretty common. We have time for one more question. Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, with POW interrogations, was there any systematic process to do that? Yes, there was actually. Not only at POWs, but also of uh, people going back and forth across the lines. As you know, there was not supposed to be, but there was a lot of commerce across the lines. And it was done quite systematically by individuals like David McLean around Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and uh, John Clark, Major John Clark, and others. And up in the uh, area of the Upper Hudson, a great deal was done. It was all fed back through local commanders, and when it was tactically useful for local commanders, often militia commanders, because they were the pickets for the most part, it was utilized. A lot of that was utilized in Washington's deception plan for Yorktown. And again, vast detail about that in the book in terms of the time element, how it was done. Let me say a little about deception. Deception is probably the least understood of the counterintelligence disciplines. And I mean, I've, and I've talked to a lot of guys who were in charge of deception plans who really didn't understand the philosophical aspect before. It's very tough because you need three elements. Number one, you need to be able to control the information your side is putting out. That's not easy. That's not easy at all. It often means you lie to your own people. You spread rumors to your own people. Okay. Number two, you need individuals who are double agents who are trusted by your adversary so that the information you want to give to them comes from sources that they trust, that they actually believe they control. In most cases, that they actually think recruited themselves. That's often understood. Number three, 
you've got to have penetrations of the enemy yourself so that you can get the feedback to know what is working, whether they're accepting what you're saying, and how you need to emphasize through your double agent network and other means what you need to allow your deception plan to work. Washington did that great. You, uh, the best deception plan categorized in history is probably the British work, and the two books on that are uh, Bodyguard of Lies, and what's the other one, Bob? Uh, Double-cross double system, yeah. bodyguard of lies, exactly. Except Washington did it in 1773, uh, 1771, and did it It was remarkable. And yet, very few military historians looked at it and saw it for what it was until you put the pieces together of how it all worked. And, of course, Clinton and Cornwallis, after the war, spent a fortune attacking each other in pamphlets and through surrogates claiming miscommunication, misdirection, lack of understanding of the tactical situation of supporting him in, in Yorktown. And the truth of the matter is they both should have blamed Washington because he was the one that tricked them both. <laughs> okay. All right, well, thank you very My much. Pleasure.